Hey, it's Derek Kilmartin from CodeOpinion.com, and this is the 2025 edition of the Loosely Coupled Monolith. If you're unfamiliar, over five years ago, back in 2020, I posted a series of blog posts and videos outlining what the Loosely Coupled Monolith is, and this kind of spurred the idea, I just was recently tagged in this, that somebody read those posts and moved forward with it, now to today, and saying that confidently it was the best decisions that they made. It was more flexible, better scalability, and a structure that actually holds up. What you're gonna get out of this video come from three key points. Focusing on cohesion, managing coupling, and realizing that your logical boundaries aren't your physical boundaries. We're gonna circle back to those at the end because they're really gonna make you think the last 10, 15 years of kind of this microservices or monolith makes absolutely no sense when you're really thinking about those three key points. So the first two points of focusing on cohesion and managing coupling really go hand in hand. If you're working in a system or don't wanna build a system that's hard to change, that's easy to introduce bugs, it's likely because you have a high degree of coupling and low cohesion. That's where we really wanna focus in on breaking apart a big system and don't produce a big system. But what I like to say is instead of building a turd pile, really what you wanna be doing is building a little piles of turd, basically, because the reality of any system is not everything is gonna be great. Sure, we wanna think that everything is like this gold-plated or diamond, you know what I mean, awesome system, but the reality of it is you may have parts of your system that are great. You may have parts of your system that aren't so great. But really what we wanna do is we really wanna break apart our system into logical boundaries. Before I get too deep into finding the structure of a loosely coupled monolith, I'd like to thank Current for sponsoring this video. Current's an event native data platform that feeds real-time business critical data with historical context and fine-grained streams from origination to destination, enhancing data analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Current, check out the link in the description. So what's a logical boundary? Well, it's just a grouping of functionality that the capabilities of your system, they're not all created equal. Oftentimes you're gonna have the core part of your system, that's really where the value is and kind of those are the capabilities that your end user are using. But there's also other parts of the system that are required, they're essential to support that core part of what you're doing. Here's an example of this in transportation that's really gonna illustrate some important concepts. So I have a logical boundary on the left called recruitment and a logical boundary on the right of dispatch. I put some concepts within inside of them to kind of illustrate this. So on in recruitment, we have things like a driver, a vehicle, compliance, and in dispatch, we have things like a shipment, a vehicle, a driver, and a position. Now, oftentimes this is the way developers are thinking about logical boundaries, specifically if you think of say like the driver, the vehicle as entities, and we're really often focused on entities. That's the first mistake because entities don't really describe what the capabilities are and the functionality because one model doesn't need to rule them all. And this is why it's so important is that you'll see here that I have vehicle listed in both recruitment and dispatch. In recruitment, the vehicle has things like compliance related to insurance. Uh, the driver has things like their driver's license, etc. And it's kind of more in that supporting role because the real value of our system relates to dispatch. The vehicle in dispatch, while it's representing a vehicle, isn't the same concept of a vehicle as it is in recruitment. They have very different concerns. The vehicle in this case is related to a shipment that's executing a shipment. The, the actions that are performed here, it's beyond entities. Really what we're focusing on are what are the capabilities. So that relates to the first point of focusing on cohesion about the capabilities of your system. And that's how you're defining your logical boundaries. As to give an example of what those capabilities are, on the dispatch side of that particular boundary, you're doing things like dispatching in order. Once you actually execute and go through the workflows, part of the workflows are arriving at the shipper or the consignee picking up the freight, departing, positions along the way en route to the delivery, arriving at the delivery, unloading the freight, related in having copies of the, your bill of lading. I'm getting into the weeds here of shipping, but you can understand the concept of just a vehicle. No, it has capabilities, a part of what those actions are. When we're talking about a, a vehicle, again, back on the, the recruitment side related to compliance, that has nothing to do with actually executing a shipment. That's why I'm saying that focusing on just solely as an entity being a singular thing in your system isn't really the case. You need focus on cohesion of capabilities. Once you define what the logical boundaries are, the groupings of functionality, 
they're gonna have to interact in some way. So let's define kind of the code project structure from a development view of what a logical boundary is. Now I have this broken down into three parts. You can view this as projects, modules, packages, depending kind of on the platform that you're in. So the first portion here is contracts. This is really your public API, you can think of it that way. This is the lowest form of coupling kind of constructs that your platform supports. An interface, a delegate, a function definition, could just be kind of a plain class or object of a schema definition of a message. I'll get more into that in a second. So this is kind of what you're exposing from your logical boundary. This is kind of like the public API. Your implementation is the actual code that actually has to execute and do what it needs to do, right? So if you think about you have an interface, well, this is the implementation of that interface. So we have to manage coupling. And that's the way we're doing it is that we're not having other implementations reference other implementations. Rather, we have implementations reference those contracts, that public API. So we can see on my middle um, boundary here, it's referencing the contracts from both other logical boundaries. That's how we're managing coupling, is managing coupling to those public APIs, to those contracts. Because each logical boundary defines its capabilities, the functionality, of course there's data behind those capabilities that we have to persist, manage, etc. And each logical boundary owns its own data. That's why I'm illustrating it this way. Oftentimes this gets confused, this illustration, thinking like, well, each has to have its own database. No, not at all. It really could be living in the same database instance. Each just has its own schema, its own ownership of a set of tables that it is the only one that reads and writes from. So regardless of how you're kind of defining where you're persisting data, it's about ownership of that data from the capabilities that kind of need to manage it in that logical boundary. In other words, we can't have that middle logical boundary, just reach out and query your update data from another logical boundary. This cannot happen. We have to be using that public API, that contracts, that's how we're managing coupling. We don't wanna have another form of coupling to our schema at the database level. So where does the loosely coupled part of the name come in? Well, we defined our logical boundaries, focusing on cohesion of capabilities. We're managing coupling the best way we can right now, but there's other ways to manage coupling, and that is being loosely coupled through messaging. One of the benefits that messaging gives us is it removes the temporal aspect of that coupling. So we can have two different boundaries coupled to each other because they need to communicate and interact with each other, but they don't need to execute at the exact same time. So I'm illustrating with a message broker here, but at the end of the day, it's really just about message passing and executing asynchronously. This could be using your database, in process, with separate threads, Depends on your use case and what actually works for you. But to illustrate the point of messaging, my part here is like we have one logical boundary that something's occurred. And we actually wanna publish an event to some message broker that we have other logical boundaries that need to be aware of something actually occurred. And they can react to that and consume that message and process it. We're not having an implementation uh, reference directly another contract for execution purposes. We doing that for kind of the message schema purpose. That's another kind of point of the contracts project is what the schema is for the message. So we're not coupled at runtime at all here. Really, we're asynchronously publishing messages and consuming them separately, all within the same monolith. Now, everything I've illustrated so far opens up a lot of possibilities and different ways that you can take this. One of them is scaling. So we have three logical boundaries and I put them all in this blue box to illustrate one thing that this is all the same code base. But the reality of it is how you build this and deploy this can be different. So we're talking about, okay, well maybe we have an HTTP API for kind of a web portion, and then we're using messaging, so we also have to consume messages. Well really those are just two different entry points into your application, into your system, and how you feed those messages through the pipeline of whatever your web framework is, or maybe, maybe however you need to messaging framework library to process messages. But ultimately, our HTTP API and the worker, it's the same code base. It may be just be building out different executables or different containers. I'll get that into a second. But that's what allows the scale. It's still a monolith. We're still using the same code base, but we're outputting two different entry points. That means that we can scale out each individually. Maybe we have more web traffic, so we scale our HTTP API behind a load balancer differently. Maybe we have a lot of more message processing and we can scale that, our workers that consume our messages from our queue, our message broker, separately. You can scale out how you want differently. Just because a singular code base doesn't need to be a singular entry point in what you're outputting 
a part of your builds. Which gets us to the last point that I made at the very beginning, that logical boundaries aren't physical boundaries. Too often we get caught in this a logical boundary, a functionality that we have. We have source code in a repo for that. We build that and deploy that as some artifact, like a container as an example, and it's a one-to-one-to-one. -one -to -one. But it doesn't need to be that way. Instead, we could have a logical boundary that we turn, that we have its source code, like I was just illustrating, that turns into two different executables or different deployment artifacts. We could have a container that's our HTTP API. We could have another container that's doing all the background work, processing messages off our uh, queue or message broker. Or maybe we have a logical boundary that's separated into two source code repos. Maybe we're split between backend and frontend, and we deploy those each as that. Or maybe it's that way, but we combine, uh, combine at build time so that we have a single container, that's our HTTP API, that's also serving our HTML and JavaScript files. Where I'm going with this is you can mix and match this however you want. What I've really been illustrating is we have a bunch of different logical boundaries into a single source code repo that we may be deploying in multiple ways with an HPI and a worker. Logical boundaries are not physical boundaries. I don't think I can stress that enough because not acknowledging it is incredibly limiting. So if we have logical boundaries that are loosely coupled by messaging, we can deploy them all together like we're doing now, that's fine. But we also might decide, you know what? We have different scaling concerns so for these two logical boundaries, we're gonna package this up as a container for that deployment artifact, and we can decide the other one, we're gonna scale it completely separately, differently. Maybe it has a higher volume of messages or HTTP API requests, and it can be scaled completely separately. This is possible. And that's a loosely coupled monolith. Having logical boundaries within that, a groups of functionality that are highly cohesive in managing the coupling between these logical boundaries preferring asynchronous messaging as a way to loosely couple between them. The key part of this too is realizing that logical boundaries aren't physical boundaries. And that's why I said at the very beginning of this, this discussion around microservices or a monolith, which one's better, which one should I use? The, the whole conversation is pointless if you realize that logical boundaries aren't physical boundaries. But we got into this mode where, well, I have some functionality, I'm gonna group it in one way, I'm gonna have a source code repo for that, and then I'm gonna deploy it as a service. It doesn't need to be this way. You could have many logical boundaries in the same source code repo, physically deployed in different ways. You can mix and match this however you want. If you're new to the loosely coupled monolith, get in the comments and let me know your thoughts. If you're already aware of it and watch the videos or read the blog post from 2020, five years ago, let me know how I did on my updated version, kind of re-explaining it, I think hopefully in a little bit of a different way. Get in the comments and let me know your thoughts. I also wanna thank Joey for posting this. When I posted this stuff back in 2020 with my blogs and videos, I really had no idea who was watching it or it had any impact at all. It clearly did on one person, so I really do appreciate the comment. And I really can't describe how much I appreciate everybody that's watched these videos, joined my channel, supported my channel. I had no idea where any of this was really gonna start in 2020 when I started posting these videos. And this loosely couple monolith was really probably the, one of the first things I really posted online, so in terms of YouTube. So again, I really appreciate everybody for your support. If you wanna support my channel, you can join it. The link's in the description on how to join. You can get access to a private Discord server, chat with other software developers about topics like this and software architecture and design. The link's in the description on how to join. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.